I carefully identified all the existing leads going to the big filter cap. I unmounted it, uncrimped one end, heated it up, and pulled the insides out. I did the same for the smaller cap that goes up here. Now I have one left to do, that one that's actually mounted on the top side. That's right in here. So I'm in the process of disconnecting these leads. I used a solder sucker to get most of the solder out, and now I'm using a little bit of wick to remove the last few traces. After removing and labeling all the wires and a little ceramic disc capacitor, I removed the solder from the two lugs and untwisted them and was able to pull out the cap from the other side. Now I will go around and uncrimp the seam using a little screwdriver, knife, whatever it takes, and then heat up the can and pull out the insides. If you look back through my videos, I've shown this technique a number of times. After drilling some holes in the old bases to feed leads through, I mounted the capacitors. I had to get a bit creative and run some extension wires, then hot glue it all together to make sure it would fit inside of the old cans. And now the next step is to seat these down and then recrimp the seal. And then I can start remounting and rewiring them in the chassis. I finished wiring in the rebuilt electrolytics here, here, and here. So that takes care of everything underneath the chassis, I think. Oh, except for one item. One of my viewers pointed out that it might be a good idea to relocate this cap from this side of the switch to this side, and I agree, so I'm going to see if I can reroute that connection. Because with the uh, hooked up like this, it's always across the AC line, even when the set's turned off, because it goes right to the AC plug. And if there's some kind of power surge or issue with the AC line, it could damage or blow out that cap, so why not just move it over here. Alright, so let's take a look at the other side of the chassis. Okay, not too much to look at up here with this board out. I'll pop the cover off this and show you guys what's in there, and I think you'll see that uh, very little, hopefully very little to do under there. Same goes for the tuner. The controls, I'll spray them with some deoxit and uh, just keep my fingers crossed that they're all okay. Need to replace this bulb. Hopefully I've got one on hand. It's uh, type 44. I think I've got some of these. Oh, uh, then there's this area. I misspoke earlier when I was talking about how there should be a rectifier up in here, or a pair of diodes rather up in here. That's true of the 9L38 chassis used in the tandem sets. And the 9L37 chassis like this the rectifiers are actually over here. And what this thing is, which was confusing me, that is actually uh, the connection for uh, focus, which is this right here. This pitch tube uses electrostatic focus. And uh, typically on sets that don't have the wacky swivel CRT on top, you actually uh, switch the jumper for the focus voltage on the base of the CRT. But on this set, that's what this jumper's for. So you either put it here or you put it here. Whichever one gives you the better focus. So this lead actually goes around to one of these two connectors which goes up to the CRT. So this, this lead goes to 290 volts or so. Actually it goes to the boost. A few variations in this design. One goes to 
the supply, but in my set it goes through 470k or 47k resistor rather to the boost voltage. And you can choose either that or the ground. Apparently, with electrostatic focused tubes, there's no need to have a, a control to vary between zero and say 400 and something volts. It's just either one or the other. All right, so <laughs> we'll just go with that. Now, as far as these rectifiers go, and the 9L38, and actually, I think pretty much every other predictor, they use silicon diodes. Uh, actually, no, that, that's not true. Uh, I think in the really early revisions of the Princess and Siesta set, they use a 5U4 rectifier tube. But in, uh, in all the other sets I have, they all use silicon diodes. But this has germanium diodes, and at the time they must have been pretty cutting edge. Because every set I've got older than this, they use uh, selenium. And you can see them on here, it's these two guys. Now what's curious about it is these capacitors here. So 1000 picofarad and 22 picofarad attached to each diode. You can see one of them here, it's this three-legged cap. And then there are two caps down here inside. I'm not sure why exactly that was. I don't know if these early primitive diodes were sensitive to transients or RF noise or what the deal was, why they had to put these caps on the diodes. But that's the way they are. I guess I'll just leave them in place. Uh, I'm going to replace these with 1N4007 modern silicon diodes, which I don't think you really need these capacitors for, but eh, they won't do any harm, I suppose, if I leave them in. So the diodes, you can see one of them right here, and the other one's down in here, right there. I think these two uh, heatsink sleeves uh, actually slide apart somehow. But the, uh, they're interlocking. Let's see. Yeah, I'll poke around with it. I'll carefully remove these leads. Uh, I'm not quite sure how I'm going to mount the new diodes. I suppose I should try to preserve the original look. But the new diodes don't look anything like these old ones. I've unmounted the IF shield so we can take a look at what's underneath. And as you can see, not too much. No paper caps to replace whatsoever. Mostly just coils and ceramic capacitors and a few resistors which I will double check. And I'll check the three tubes. And uh, that should do it. If I really need to, if I find a number of these resistors are off value, I will have to unwrap these wires and undo the solder lugs just like on the other board. Here's a closer look at that module. And I guess this variation only has the one capacitor. It doesn't have the 22 picofarads in there anywhere. No, it doesn't seem like it's very easy to get those old germanium diodes out of there. I tried heating up one side, and I don't know what kind of connection that is, but it uh, wouldn't seem to do anything. And this is aluminum, which you really can't solder to anyways. So, I'm not sure what kind of material they used. Uh, so, at any rate, what I think I'm just going to do is use a terminal strip to mount these replacement diodes. There's no need to heat sink these much more efficient, they really, uh, there's so little loss across them, they just don't get very warm. So, if I mount this down in here, I can mount my two diodes on it, and then hook these wires up to it. Here's how I replaced those germanium diodes. I did go with a terminal strip. And I did reuse that capacitor, and then there's a silicon diode on either side there, and I hooked up the wire in the same way. So that should be good to go.